30 seconds to open mic. I'm just going to open. We'll talk about this. Well. Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, we're going to talk a lot of local sports. We're going to dive into the New Orleans Saints heavy. Uh, we'll also touch on possibly the New Orleans Pelicans, the LSU Tigers, and the Tulane Green Wave if we have some time. We've got a great panel for you tonight. Uh, Mike Triplett of ESPN is with us. Sean Fazan of Fox 8 Sports will be joining us in just a few moments. And uh, for the first time, we'll, we'll try to do something a little bit different than what we normally do as we start the show uh, because we have some great news. Um, we want to thank the New Orleans Press Club uh, for um, the winning the in, uh, winning uh, the first place award for the 2015 Press Club's Excellent in Journalism Award for the category of Best TV Sports Show. And uh, as I mentioned on Facebook, it is probably the um, probably the biggest ups upset since Andrew Jackson <laughs> <laughs> beat the British, considering fourth down on four and also. Um, Fox 8 Tailgate were uh, also the nominees. So special thanks, first of all, to, again, the New Orleans Press Club, also to all the sports reporters who have made this show possible. Without the New Orleans sports media coming on this show on a week-in, week-out basis, this would not have been possible. And also I've got to thank, again, Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, uh, my director, William Hill, who does a fantastic job behind the scenes, but also uh, Donovan Joseph. Kenny Juno, Philip Williamson, Amanda Lyons, who's no longer with us, but did a great job while she was here, Naila Jones, and Richard King. That's the entire staff that works on this show here at WLAE TV. And I got to tell you, we are all very, very proud of this particular award. And uh, again, we will cherish it. And thanks to you guys for watching the uh, TV show on a day in, day out basis as well. Well, we'll get the, t the show started. Sean's going to be joining us in just a couple minutes, but we'll start off talking a little bit to Mike Trippett, find out about what's going on, about if he's all packed yet, ready to go to uh, Saints yeah. camp. Mike, welcome to the show. Again, thank yeah, you for thanks. your participation because yeah, you've been I'll a take great guest. This one's yeah, for me. Actually, get a little chip off the side. Just, <laughs> just knock that off the side and you take that one home tonight. But thanks again for, for being with us tonight. Happy to and join you. Tell us a little bit about, about ESPN and what you're, you're going to be doing with ESPN at camp and what you do on a daily basis as well. Yeah, look, we cover the, uh, the Saints uh, like a local entity, and, and they do that with all 32 NFL teams every day. Uh, there's something on ESPN.com. Starting in about a week, there'll yes. be an endless flow in that Saints blog. Uh, obviously, TV appearances as well, radio, ESPN, the magazine. Um, so they cover every team with, with uh, on a real local level. I think uh, hopefully it's something the fans have really appreciated and uh, gotten used to reading. I uh, I really enjoy it, Mike. And again, from from obviously what you're writing on a daily basis, but also the video, uh, which yep. again you do as well. And uh, again, we thank you for being here with us uh, tonight. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Sean Bazan's going to join us on the program, and we're going to kick it off right here on Inside New Orleans Sports. Don't go anywhere. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. statistics. Thing is, I could have dropped out of school and become one myself, but I didn't because I had people that believed in me. Here's another statistic. 7,000 students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. It's time that students know that we believe in them. Inspire a student and share your message of support at boostup.org. 
St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is literally saving kids' lives. It's a very special place, friendly place. And to see the kids that they're helping on a daily basis was unbelievable. Families never receive a bill from St. Jude. Discoveries made at St. Jude are freely shared. The hardest cancer cases in the world go to St. Jude. We won't stop until no child dies from cancer. Join us. Join us. In supporting hoops for St. Jude. Visit stjude.org slash hoops to find out how. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Derek Asher. Mike Triplett is one of our guests, along with Sean Vazan of Fox 8 Sports. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being with us. And as always, I'd like to let you let people know a little bit about what you guys are going to be doing at Fox 8 and how you're already packed and ready to go. Yeah, to it's, uh, you get to that point. You know, I had a couple weeks off of vacation, mm -hmm. and I, I've found like three excuses to go into the office already because I'm just I'm, I'm at that point where I'm itching for football season right now. And uh, we pack up, we leave Sunday, and uh, we'll head out. We'll drive for two days and get out to the Greenbrier. We'll start our reports on Tuesday, and uh, we'll be Saints football full speed ahead, foot per firmly pressed on the gas <laughs> from here through what? January, February, March, the whole nine. But uh, it's what we do, right? So yeah. it's uh, and we'll have four, five, nine, and ten. The web after further review, my blog, uh, video, everything you can imagine on Saints football. It's gonna be fun. Well, guys, uh, before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what's going on with the Saints. Are you guys glad? I mean, are you happy now that, again, <laughs> you'll be able to go to camp, mm -hmm. you'll be able to see actual football yeah. instead of pontificating about <laughs> what you think may happen. You know, last year we were all talking about, mm -hmm. on paper, this looks like the best team in Saints history, mm -hmm. Super Bowl contender. I think a lot of us have kind of maybe pulled back on the reins yeah. a little bit this year. They're going to have to kind of prove it to us. But are you guys glad that, that football's back or at well, least We're about to back? spend the next 55 minutes pontificating yeah, on what's exactly. going to happen. So in an hour, I'll be glad. No, you're right. It's my favorite time of year every, every year. Um, tough to leave the family and go to West Virginia mm -hmm. for this long. But football, the players, the practices, the preseason. I even mean, like preseason games, but when you're actually seeing it on the field, all the stuff you've been talking about, it is always uh, the fans. It's true. I, I don't think they read or follow us more. There's two times they follow us the most. First week of training camp and the draft. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, free agency has boom, boomed yeah. as well in that regard. But the storylines this year are mm -hmm. so prevalent. You know, there, there's, a, there's a sense of mystery. And I think, as you said, we're, I think – this team has the potential to be a playoff team, a very good team, maybe sure. even a championship team, but none of us want to say that this year because right. we were all yeah. guilty of it last year. A well, we ton of storylines, uh, and <clears throat> there is a little bit of mystery surrounding this club this year, yeah. and, uh, and I think that's a good thing as we head into uh, training camp because you have all these questions, and then hopefully you get your answers. Let's talk about coaching first because, mm -hmm. again, um, I don't want to say Sean Payton took the year off last year because he didn't, but I thought Sean Payton came into this maybe not as focused as he has been in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's obviously made some changes within his staff. They made some changes within the front office. Michael, I'll, I'll start with you first. Do you think we'll see a, a more focused Sean Payton, a, a, Sean Fa a Sean Payton that'll be maybe more of the taskmaster that we saw maybe when, when, his, when he first started his tenure here? I got the feeling that he really relied on, on the veteran leadership last year, which didn't materialize. Well, I, I don't know that <clears throat> I'd quite word it that way, that he wasn't focused, but I think uh, maybe miscalibrated on what the team needed because um, it wasn't a very self-motivated team last year. I think the young defensive players admittedly um, felt pretty good about themselves. Mm -hmm. it, 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 from that side of the football, it felt like a Super Bowl hangover year. Everybody, you said best roster ever. Uh, how many of them thought they were going to their first Pro Bowl last mm -hmm. year? Um, you know, they had finished fourth in defense the year before, and there was a lot of buzz around Kenny Vaccaro and Jarris Bird and uh, Keenan Lewis and Junior Gallette and Cam Jordan and, you know, how many of these guys are all going to go to the Pro Bowl. And then that unit really took a huge step back. Um, and then the offense obviously ha had its shortcomings too, but I think it caught a lot of people by surprise. Uh, uh, Zach Streep talked a lot ab about saying the veteran leadership, it's, it's our job to teach these guys. And then Sean Payton said, you know, you realize these guys haven't heard all your speeches before. They haven't, you know, the culture building. <laughs> It slowly became a point where you and, and they're now they're talking about 2006 a lot, which is when they first mm -hmm. established the culture and the identity of the team. And I think they realized, you know, it's been such a long time. We need to do that again. We can't say we're going to win because we've always won. This is a new team, and I think I think they all came to realize that a little too late last year. Well, my, yeah. my biggest criticism of Coach Payton last year was that. I think he saw the problem within the locker room, but I think he saw it a little bit too late. It was, it was, it was. I can remember the meltdown. Maybe it was, uh, was it the Carolina game at, in the dome where he just, it, you know, we're, we're not that good. We're, that's painfully obvious. Well, that was all the way in December. Yeah. I felt like while he may have had those issues or maybe been, you know, feeling that internally, he he didn't materialize or you know uh, tell that to us until 
uh, later in the season. I just felt like last year, look, the organization, he sets the tone. And I thought he thought they were a lot closer than they actually were. And when you had... When you have that much veteran leadership walk out of the building, it, you kind of assume someone's going to step up. And you know what? That's a tricky thing to gauge, and I just mm -hmm. think they misread it. And all the while, in, in, in sort mm -hmm. of a, a minor state of denial, if you will, and that maybe this, they just kind of thought this is going to happen. It's going to come together. It's going to come together. Oh, lo and behold, it's December and it still hadn't come together. And then you realize you had a problem. I'm stay with you for a moment, Sean. Talk about the, the change on the defensive staff and, and, and uh, how you think that may work going forward. <sighs> you know, a lot of people are <laughs> – we're curious about the Dennis Allen hire. Uh, I think we all were. And I think we are <clears throat> still. Yeah. I, I'm curious to see how that works. However, you and I have been around Dennis for a while. We know him, uh, from, from at least from that standpoint. I think he's got the personality to, to, to deal with, a, with a, 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 an alpha type in, in Rob Ryan that, that can be a guy that can be a, a complimentary guy, offer his suggestions. And the fact that he is Sean Payton's guy, Rob Ryan would be willing to kind of accept those suggestions. So I – I'm a little more optimistic about that dynamic than maybe other people because I just think Dennis Allen's personality lends itself to working with people as opposed to being it's my way, not his way. Mike, touch on that and then also touch on some of the changes in the front office as well and how you thought sure. those went. Well, it's interesting with Dennis <clears throat> Allen because, you know, when he was a secondary coach here before, Greg Williams was the defense mm -hmm. coordinator. He was a dynamic personality. It's not like he's a Greg Williams protege. Mm -hmm. right. He's his own man, and, and I talked to Jabari Greer about – uh, what Dennis Allen did so well, and, and he called him sort of like a translator. He said he was so great at teaching us mm -hmm. in that secondary room why we were doing what we were doing, what the game plan was, what the receivers were going to do, and he really taught us, and he says he thinks he'll be that for Rob Ryan. And really the secondary is where they were the mm -hmm. most dysfunctional last year. Blown assignments, blown coverages in big moments, uh, missed tackles and everything. So it, there's a lot going on. They simplified the playbook. Mm -hmm. um, which has, has been a problem that's plagued Rob Bryan, um, where they said they've had to do that when, when the team isn't grasping the all the different checks and balances they're going to do. So they're just going to play fast. And then I think he wanted to bring Dennis Allen to teach that unit specifically. So they're going to know what Rob Bryan is. Rob Bryan's still calling the mm -hmm. scheme, still calling the plays. Dennis Allen's going to be the one teaching them the X's and O's of it. So it really can work mm -hmm. as it did when, when he was here with Greg Williams, I think. Uh, but obviously if things go south, then, you know, Whose fault is it? Uh, who you know is he the next defensive coordinator and waiting? That tension could come if things don't go yeah. well, obviously. But uh, uh, as far as the front office changes, I think uh, I think most of them took place. Well, at least the Jeff Ireland move mostly mm -hmm. took place because Ryan Pace left. Mm -hmm. I th I don't know that they would have made that move if Ryan Pace stayed. Uh, Ryan Pace had already sort of taken over for Rick Reprish as the director of mm -hmm. college scouting. Uh, so when they lost pace, they had that big vacancy, and they decided, let's go look elsewhere because we also need to shake things up and brought in uh, Jeff Ireland. So I think it was mostly about that, but obviously uh, they made the change with Rick Reprish and several other scouts, and they really revamped that college scouting department, which is sort of a long-term move. I think they also, though, said they want to look at how they're scouting players differently. They drafted more linebackers than ever before and higher than ever before. I think they realize, uh, this is a, um, something that Mickey Loomis talked about even before the draft, they realize we have to look at why we have not had consistent success on defense for a decade. Is it how we're drafting them, how we're scouting them, what we're asking them to do? And so that starts from the players they're acquiring to the playbook and the coaches. What can you, what can you add? And it, did you see Ireland's fingerprints on yeah, anything yeah. in the offseason? Well, <clears throat> Defensive players, for one, was it six? Six, and, uh, six seven, of them, I believe, right? Okay, they drafted? Uh, uh, seven that they drafted. Um, I don't know that uh, Rick Reiprich was six. A, a guy that – Six, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that he was a guy that, that did a lot of things wrong. I just felt like as an organization, Sean Payton and Mickey Loomis talked and they said, look, we've got to make some tough decisions here. We have gotten complacent, and maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Given how bad the draft had turned out from just one year ago – uh, that they wanted some fresh eyes and, and, and sort of a fresh way of going about things. And I think, I think he, even Mickey even talked about this after the draft, that he was a little bit of a voice of reason where I think, you know, you got Peyton and you got Loomis who are who, whose kind of natural instinct is to let's go get that player, let's trade, let's get, let's get him. <clears throat> and it was Riper's kind of a steady hand, let's hold off, let's see what's happening, and then let's kind of let the draft come to us. So I do think there was some Rick Riper's in there. And I think they trust him uh, because of his resume, and I think Sean Payton has a connection with him back in their days in Dallas. So, yeah, I do think there was a little bit of his handprints all over the draft. <clears throat> let's have the phone lines, 866-3200. Greg is in Homa. Greg, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Greg. Hey, uh, my question is, is um, 
do you think that the, the slow start the Saints had was due to Drew Brees' oblique situation, or do you think it was the lackluster of the training camp? Greg, thank, hang you up and listen. thank you for the phone call. I'm going to say neither. I, I, I thought yeah. it's funny because I think even, even Peyton talked, I believe it was uh, our good friend Jeff Duncan in, in a column he had. Uh, some, had they won a few of those games early on, maybe the season turns out totally different. Sometimes winning can kind of breed that culture. I, I just that, Look, there was some breakdowns in the secondary in both of those games, and I think ultimately uh, it, it, it was a chance to win, and they just didn't seize the moment. I don't know that it was uh, the Greenbrier. I, I know that's a, that's a hot topic for a lot of people because they think it made the Saints soft. I don't know if I saw that because I – I, I thought it was a pretty decent training camp, but and I thought by the time the regular season began, Drew Brees was pretty healthy. I just thought they just they didn't seize the moment like they had in years past. No, I agree on both counts because first of all, I predict I, my expectations for the Saints were a little tame last mm -hmm. year. I think I picked them to go 11 and five, mm -hmm. and thought they were going to be very similar to 2013 team. And I remember in that Week One game at Atlanta, about midway through the second or third quarter, I was like, oh, I screwed up. This team's going 13-3. and three. Yeah. That offense mm -hmm. looked mm -hmm. fantastic in that game, and the defense was terrible yep. in that game. Uh, Cleveland, they did get off to a slow start. That is uh, very common to go out to a place like Cleveland. They still rallied back, had a chance to win. Defense blew it again. Uh, it was the defensive struggles early on, so I don't blame uh, Drew Brees' is oblique or, or anything like that. Um, and, and really all year long, I think, having to make up for that defense and, and the pass protection hurt Drew Brees. The Greenbrier training camp, I don't think the, the training camp site is a problem, right. and I don't think it was too lax, so to speak. They're not out, Just because it's a country club doesn't mean they're out there doing right. country club activities. But it was the same thing we talked about earlier in the mm -hmm. show, which is the culture. And I specifically remember talking to Zach Streif, who I think has a great – finger on a pulse for this team um, and talking about you don't go to a place like Jackson, Mississippi and have those hot practices uh, unless you're trying to establish a new culture. He goes, we don't need to establish mm -hmm. a new culture here. I think that's where they miscalculated. Mm -hmm. They treated it like this was an established team and they were trying to have a smart training camp. They won a Super Bowl doing that mm -hmm. in 2009. Yes. And, and 2011, they didn't really, you know, they had an abbreviated training camp. But, and they went to Oxnard for a week. That all worked out well. But I don't think they realized that this training camp, the, the, the approach to training camp should have been, we're starting from scratch more than it was. Because we've seen a turnover on this roster, uh, and you've got, both of you guys have talked about the culture tonight. Will we see a more demanding camp this year out of Sean Payton? To the limits you can do. It's a lot different than it was in 06 with, again, the new collective bargaining agreement uh, in terms of how hard you can work a team. But we will we see a more demanding uh, Sean Payton when it comes to this tra training camp. I think so. I think – I look, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, you, you and I have both been around him a lot. I see a little bit of a, a shift with him uh, just in, in terms of the way he's going about things. You can tell he's a little more focused, and he did some self-scouting of his own. And I think – I think there will be maybe a little more eyes, so, you know, a couple of more, you know, call out sessions, if you will, in meetings. No one knows what happens when they get inside the advocate center. Sure. We can't see that. Right. Uh, but I do think the whole approach is going to be much more focused, internal, uh, and, and usually that would mean a more demanding head coach because, look, right. as I said, there's no expectation of success this year. I mean, there is, but there's a sense of mystery. No one really knows how good they're going to be. They got expectations of success in that building. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, of course. But And Sean Payton will be more like that, but he also won't have to be more like that because this team, I mean, you hear from all the players that I said last year, as they admitted, were drinking the Kool-Aid mm -hmm. and thinking, yes. no, I mean, you know, you hear them all talk and they're like, you know, Rob Ryan said it. I know Kenny Vaccaro said it. Another player said it. It's almost the same thing. It's like, don't ask us how good we think we're going to be because even if we think we have 10 great practices in a row, we're not going to say it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, we're going to lower our heads and we're just going to do it this year. You know, we all talked about the lack of leadership. The, let, me, let's say, let, me, let me say the loss of leadership mm -hmm. on this team last year. And I'm going to the phone lines in a moment. Uh, what about the addition of Unger, uh, Kevin Williams, Browning, uh, uh, Browner rather? Talk about those guys and, and what they're bringing to the table now because all those guys have Super Bowl rings and maybe they replace some of the guys, long-time guys here, who knew the Peyton way. I think, I think Browner's the big one yeah. out of that really? group. Out because, of all of them? Out of all of them because it's, it's the unit that needed it most. <clears throat> um, you could say, boy, they missed Will Smith and John Vilma and Roman Harper and Malcolm Jenkins. A lot of those guys had been sort of phased out anyway and, and didn't play a lot mm -hmm. the year before because of injuries and stuff. Um, but they didn't – the problem was – 
that no, nobody knew who was supposed to emerge and be that leader. He comes in and he says, that's what they brought me in here for. I embrace it. You hear so many guys say, I like to lead by example. Mm -hmm. If somebody asks me, I'll speak up, but hopefully just, Curtis you know, um, well, a lot of guys say that, but Browner says, I'm not, he's not afraid to talk. It's something that everybody has always complimented him about in past stops. He just tweeted a picture of uh, his that. Super Bowl <laughs> ring and Robert Kraft said, I loved you in the locker room, you know, and, and, uh, uh, players are saying, boy, he stepped up. And, and that, that exact quote I just said, Kenny Vaccaro was, said that br after a good practice they had, Browner said, hey, you guys were 7-9 and nine last year. Like, I mean, he's that voice. Mm -hmm. And Rob Bryan's complimented for being it. And he's not, he's not a shutdown corner at this stage of his career. Mm -hmm. Might not go to the Pro Bowl or anything like that. But he's going to give an identity to that number two cornerback position. He's going to shove guys at the line of scrimmage. He's going to be physical. They know what they've got in that number two corner. And he's vocal and he's a leader. I, I think that's going to make a big difference. 6'4", 225-pound cornerback, I believe, <laughs> is his, his measurements. We saw him in the locker room. That's a, that, that's a dude you don't want to mess with. That, that guy is going to be an enforcer, and, you know, it, he's one of those guys that the outside matches his personality, his on-field demeanor. He's just, he's just that kind of guy. And I can recall there was a play, I believe it was Josh Morgan running a route, and it, he, may have get, he may get flagged for a play like this in the regular season just because he was bumping him so hard in the line of scrimmage. It was in five yards, but basically he knocked him completely off his route to where he fell down when the ball came. It, he may get called for pass interference on that, but it just goes to show you the tone he set. And he said, this is what I'm doing. You guys have to follow me. And it, I like the quote, you know, 7-9 team is a 7-9 team. So you have a great practice, great, but you haven't done anything until you win. And he's the guy that's won back-to-back -back Super Bowls. I agree with Mike. I think he is the guy at the position that the Saints need right now. Back to the phone lines we go, 866-3200. Peter is in New Orleans. Peter, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Thank, thank you, Eric, for thank taking you. my call. Uh, I'm curious, uh, of course, last year uh, Saints went to training camp with all the electronic and the print media and instantly proclaimed them as the greatest thing since sliced bread and were Super Bowl contenders without question. Of course, it didn't take very much longer after the first few games to realize that that was an, uh, an obvious mistake, and some people have admitted that. Now, I understand that changes have been made in the team, but it sounds like the media is at it again, uh, trying to proclaim uh, the Saints are going to be so much better uh, and, and uh, all the changes in the players and the draft choices. But the, you'll pardon me for being skeptical until they actually take the field and start the beginning of the season because it's entirely possible that all of these predictions – uh, won't come true. And so I'm, I'm curious uh, uh, to see what you all have to say about that. And uh, I thank you for taking my call, Eric. Peter, thank you for calling, and uh, thanks for your patience as well. Well, Mike? yeah, the Saints have earned everyone's skepticism. Yes, yes. Like I said, I really do think I was more reasonable mm -hmm. than, than I did not pick them to go to the Super Bowl last year. Um, there was one year when I did, and that was 2011, mm -hmm. and they were fantastic that year we saw it from mm -hmm. we knew we were seeing greatness saints are not greatness right now but they're very good they've got a lot of important pieces in place starting with coach and quarterback so i i would rank them probably among the top 10 12 teams mm -hmm. i think they're the type of team i thought this in 13 i thought this in 14 and i think it again in 15 they're the type of team that can win their division go to the playoffs be a three seed get hot at the right time and go to the Super Bowl like the Ravens who won mm -hmm. one here in, in the Superdome or the New York Giants who won one in 11 when they weren't the best team in the league. But they're, they're competent and they can get hot at the right time. That's what the Saints have been for three years, and that's kind of what they are. Not the greatest thing since sliced bread, but better than burnt toast. <laughs> well, I, I, look, I think they're a good team. I do. <clears throat> Uh, I will never say they're the best team on, on, on paper ever again. It's just not, it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> Nor will I. <laughs> um, I think you said it though. They're in the NFC South. So that division is attainable. Yes. So if you can win your division, you're a playoff team. But once we get in the playoffs, anything can happen. So I think they're in that, uh, it's hard to define elite nowadays in the, in the NFL, but I think they're in that next tier, whatever that tier is that uh, I think you said top 12 in that eight to 13 or 14 range, good enough to get in the playoffs, but also, questionable enough if they don't bring it or if they they lack focus or they do become that team as coach Peyton said last year could find themselves on the outside what, looking in. What's remarkable with them is they were terrible sometimes last year and and they were <laughs> quote unquote only seven and nine and they lost like four games in the final seconds to finish. So they're bad 
their rock bottom was like seven and mm -hmm. nine with four last right. minute losses. Mm -hmm. So they're they are an eight to ten eight. They're probably an eight to eleven win team. Eight on the low end, eleven on the high end. I think they're a very good team. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree with you, Sean. I think the optimism can be because the NFC South is so bad. But uh, I think there's a lot of question marks on this team. I mean, uh, more question marks than maybe we've seen in a, in a couple of years. You know, not just, again, some of the ways some of the guys played last year and will they be able to overcome that and have the seasons maybe they had the season before. But you look at the wide receiver position. Mm -hmm. uh, we still don't know what Tim Lolito is going to do on the, in, on the interior of the offensive line. You know, um, although the secondary looks like on paper it could be one of the strongest they've ever had. We still don't know. I mean, again, can guys come back from injury? You got some guys like like Brown who's a little bit older. You know, can can he go for a whole season? And then you really don't know what you have in the linebacker position right now. And then and then you're counting on a defensive line to rebound after having a horrible season last year. So, I think they're a very good team. I, th I think they have a chance because I think they can win their division. And I think if things fall right, they they can they can be one of those teams that'll be in the mix. But just as easily, if the the receivers don't play well. If something happens to C.J. Spiller or, or Drew Brees, they're done. They're not going. They're not going to be able to uh, to be able to compete on, on on a high level. So, I think everyone has to kind of pull the reins back this year, and let's see what happens once they start hitting. That was one of the things you guys were at minicamp. You guys watched them uh, during uh, the limited practice you could. I don't think we can tell, yeah. especially with this group right now, because there are so many unknowns on how good this team can be until until really they get out there and they start hitting, and and, and not against each other against opposing teams. Eric, the, the offensive line is such a big thing that I think we are appreciating more how dominant they were in 09 yes. and 11 when Jari Evans and Carl Nix might have mm -hmm. been the two best guards in the entire NFL. Their offensive line has a chance to be above average, but they were elite. And that we, we've nitpicked Drew Brees in this same fashion. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, Hall of Famer, elite, best in the game in 09 and 11, and now he's starting to show some, some signs of – you know, coming back down to earth. But the offensive line has, has descended more rapidly, that interior offensive line. The receiving core has descended pretty rapidly. And those, <coughs> at best, are above average units now. And I think that's what's made them more uh, more slightly above average than elite. And, and look, I, I see the, the tier rankings on ESPN, the, the quarterback right. deal. Look, <coughs> is he elite? Is he not elite? The bottom line is this. Drew Brees is still good enough <laughs> to win a Super Bowl, okay? He's still good enough to get you through to the playoffs and to a Super Bowl. So I, I thought the, the the reaction to Drew, while he did show a little bit of, of age last year, I, I think he's going to be just fine this year. And I think it's going to be – you may want to ask us about him later, but I think it's gonna be the presence of C.J. Spiller is going to be huge right. for him to be able to be that big play threat while playing small ball, if you will. No. But uh, there are a lot of questions. And if, if you told me – if a national guy came on the radio and said, this is a 7-9 ball club, could we really – no. Could we really argue with that right now? They're as close to 7-9 and nine as they are to 10-6. and six in Agreed. Mind. So many unknowns. Mm -hmm. Let's stay with Breeze for a moment. I actually had a viewer who, who uh, contacted me on Twitter asking about Drew Breeze. Um, you know, specifically to you, Mike, but you, Mike, you and I yeah. are in the same, feel the same way. I don't think Drew Breeze is a descending player. Is he the same guy he was five years ago? Look, we all, as we <laughs> age, we lose uh, arm strength, etc. But I still think if that offensive line yeah. is a solid offensive line, and they give him the time to be able to step up in that pocket and to be able to read what's going on with that defense. And again, the receivers are able to do their job. Get off the jam, be where they're supposed to be in this timing offense, and catch the football. I think Breeze can be as good as he's ever been. Your thoughts on Breeze? Yeah. I, the only thing I would take out of as good as he's ever been is 2011 might have been the best season any quarterback has ever had in NFL history. That's so, the NFL that year. He yeah, was. Yeah. Yes. Well, except for Aaron Rodgers had like, <laughs> the same season and right. won one more game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he, and Breeze has been so good in all the years he's finished second in the MVP. But, um, yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. I don't think there was a difference in Drew Breeze in 2013 and 2014. The difference was the defense was great in, in 13, and he wasn't asked to do it all. But the season he had last year, it wasn't an arm strength issue. Um, it, it, defenses did defend the deep ball a lot better. He's mm -hmm. checking down, checking down, checking down a lot. But his 20 turnovers came because they were always behind and, and there wasn't uh, great protection up front. Yes. But he had the same season in 07. He had the same season in 10. He had the same season in 12, the year Sean Payton wasn't here. 
he's done that a lot. When he tries to do it all by himself, he'll force up some ugly balls. The turnovers, especially in the big moments where you think, okay, look, they still got a chance to win, and he throws an interception late in the game, were frustrating. But the turnovers were the negative last year. Not arm strength, not age, not health. Um, and those are still question marks for him. The defense yeah. and the offensive line need mm -hmm. to improve for him to cut down on those. But that was what plagued him. Well, and for the first time in his career, he didn't have a player he could check down to like a Reggie Bush or a Darren mm -hmm. Sproles that can catch a, a check down and go for 40. Right. He'll he have checked, this he had year. players to check down to. <laughs> it, 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 but they weren't going for 40. Right. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. I think C.J. Spiller's presence is going to be huge. And let's just forget, let's just remember, it was a – People are unhappy about Drew Brees' season last year. 69% completion percentage is a bad year for him. Okay, that's yeah. that's that, that's unbelievable. That's Tony Romo, NFL, Tony Romo yeah. had 70, mm -hmm. but he threw like 140 less passes last year or something ridiculous yeah. like that. So Drew Brees is fine. Drew Brees is still good enough to get you where you want to go. It was the critical turnovers. It, that's it. Is, it. Is yeah. The Detroit Lions the game sticks out in you my know, head as well. That was it. Oh, well, you yeah. can name a lot yeah. of them. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it was him, again, trying to win, mm -hmm. trying to put the team on his back. I can do this. I can fit that ball in. Mm -hmm. Also, again, you know, in, in a roundabout way, not having Jimmy Graham here where, again, that is kind of his security blanket, I think it's going to help as well. It's going to force him to be able to spread the football around. Now, the question is, Will he be able to trust these young receivers? If he can trust you, you know he's never had a problem trusting. That's right. So he trusts <laughs> his receivers. Players, yeah. I, I think. I think obviously, honestly, he can have as good a year as any. Let's head back to the phone lines. Eight six six three two zero zero. Raymond is in Mandeville. Raymond, thanks for calling inside the World Sports. Yeah, I like to say that. Um, I think the defense will be a lot better with Dennis Allen. I think they were smart by going and getting him. Uh, I think all of us agree. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you for the phone call, guys. Yeah, it's coming on Dennis Allen. Yeah, as we said, I, I think he's a, I think you said it right. He's a translator. He sometimes you need a guy. You get you got a motivator, but he's a guy that can kind of break it down one on one and be very clear and concise as far as what a responsibility is for a player. For that secondary, especially mm -hmm. the most important unit that needs to improve and a talented unit that just needs to cut down on mental mistakes. That's it. Mac is in slot. Uh, Max is in uh, Chalmette. Mac, welcome to the show. Mac, you got us. Turn the radio, uh, turn the TV down for us. Okay, let's put Mac on hold. Let's go to Carl and Slidell, and we'll come back to Mac. Carl, welcome to the show. Carl, are you with us? Okay, guys, we'll come back to the phones in just a couple minutes. Um, on the defensive side, Junior Gallette. Still don't know what's going on here. We, we understand that, at least we think he met with the commissioner. Guys, just your gut feeling, and again, I'm, I'm on the record. I don't think he's going to play another down for the Saints. I could be proven 100% wrong on this. Uh, I just think that the, uh, the, the head coach is kind of dis very disappointed in the, in, in the way he um, really kind of took on the role of, of captain of this team, some of the off-the-field stuff that he was involved in. Uh, and uh, again, uh, looking at what they did in the draft, it, it, to me it signals the uh, – they weren't sure that he was going to be around long term anyway. Michael, take you first. Your thoughts on Junior? Is he going to be here this year? Is he going to play a prominent role in this team? Yeah, it's it's a tough question because yeah. I, I definitely agreed with your thoughts uh, back in March, especially when they were cutting ties with a lot of people. I think he made it past that hurdle, um, and when they kept him and then guaranteed his his salary for this year and his bonuses, it, it, there's sort of a financial commitment there. Then there's the latest off the field incident recently that that came up. And I think maybe they're waiting to see if there's a league suspension, which might give them an opportunity to get out of some of the guarantees in his contract if that's the route they want to go. But I think it's hard to predict they're going to cut him now because I think they would have done that already. Um, maybe they're waiting for, for a league suspension. And even that's tough to say because his two incidents are two things he never got arrested for, even though they look really bad, especially compared to one another. It, it's a huge wild card for all those reasons. And he's not healthy right now, which is that's yet it. another mm -hmm. wild card. It's it's hard to say. It really is. It's. Uh, I don't mean to sit on the fence with that one, but it's. It's hard to say because I don't think. I think th the key is what happens with the NFL. Does he face any discipline? And mm -hmm. can the Saints get out of that guaranteed money in any right. way, shape, or form? Because if they can do that, then I think they would part I ways. Think run. But let's say he's able to survive that and able to survive a suspension and or injury and is able to get back on the field. And let's just say there's another screw up. Well, then I think at that point he's out. But I think right now it's hard to say, but, but I'm kind of with Mike on this one. If they were going to cut him, they've had every opportunity to cut him right. up until now. So, well, uh, But, guys, 
they they didn't have an opportunity to cut him because they they were so uh, up against the cap. It, it would it would have been it would have been a very difficult thing for them to be able to eat all that money, right. all, all, you know, the dead money, and just this year would have crushed them. So they almost had to, they, you know, by default they had to hold on to him with maybe looking with an eye at the next year, saying this guy continues to give us problems next year. I, I think they're waiting on the NFL and hope the NFL can bail them out. It, there's a strong possibility yeah. that that's true. That that there might be a little financial uh, leeway. And the other thing, you're right. They, if they cut him in March. Every last dollar in his contract would have sped up by waiting till after June first. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were waiting till after June first, and now that June first has come, now mm -hmm. they're waiting for the NFL decision. There's yes. there's entirely a possibility that if they decide that they can move on without him, although there'd have to be an injury settlement now too. Uh, it, it, it's it's very tough to decide, but he's on double secret probation, and maybe they're going to say, maybe a humbled, motivated. Last chance, Junior Gallette will well, will be driven to to be the right kind. And of I just got to say, you know, I, I saw um, Evan Woodbury's report, and I had spoke with uh, someone that's kind of involved in the Junior situation mm -hmm. on this end, and I spoke with the person within the NFL. The investigation has kind of cranked up a little bit in terms of what he's doing, but the league is still it's been ultra secretive as far as had they had that mysterious meeting right. are they going to have it? what was said in that meeting is the suspension coming you got to wonder if maybe the the tom brady situation has kind of overshadowed that a little bit maybe this would be a little more front and center mm -hmm. head uh he had not gotten into his uh, issue tom brady i'm talking about but it is a little weird that we're, we're here it's what is it four days away from oh, camp yeah. now and all and we still don't know mm -hmm. what, what's ahead for junior galette back to the full lines we go toby is in gretna toby welcome to inside new orleans sports Hey, Toby. Yeah, I'm going to flip the script a little bit and go to high school officiating disagreement. I know they have a tentative agreement. Where does the, the money they get from Cox, if they get money from Cox Communications, can that help out in uh, paying for the officials? And I'll hang up and listen to you. Thank you. Sean, you do a, a high school show? I don't want to say anything inaccurate, so I'm not okay. sure. I really, I, I don't. I'm not sure if, if, right. if, if there's any sort of money that goes to the officials in that regard. Right, and, and, and I don't cover high school sports, so uh, I'm sorry. I'll we, check we on that. We don't I, have I, I'm not 100% sure on that one. Uh, you'll tweet it out for me if, yeah, if, if, if you I find, can out. find out. Yeah. To uh, Errol in New Orleans. Errol, welcome uh, to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Errol. Hello. Errol, you're on the air. Yes, this is Errol, returning from Harvey. Welcome to the show. Hello. Yes. Why don't you turn your television down? Welcome to the show. You have a question or a comment? Hello. Okay. okay. Let's move on. Carlos and Slidell, guys. If you can't turn your TV down, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to quit taking phone calls. Carlos and Slidell. Hey, Carl. How welcome you doing? to the show. I enjoy the show, man. Thank every, you, Carl. Every Thursday, man. Appreciate it. Uh, here's the thing about Drew Brees. Drew Brees lost four to five games last year. Uh, the Cleveland game, the Detroit game, won the Atlanta game. Okay. I mean, Drew Brees is at the beginning of the end. He lost four to five games, okay? We have to limit his attempts. We have to limit his attempts. He ain't the same man he once was. And plus, we don't have no wide receivers. And we don't have a security blanket for him. I mean, Lance Moore, I remember him, moved the chains Lance Moore, always a further down, he's gone. Who's that guy? Sproles is gone. All these boys are gone. I mean, in Brandon Cooks, I think the boy personally is too small. Who's going to be that wide receiver? And I think four games, guys, now you think about it. Four games to five games. Cleveland, Detroit, one Atlanta games, late in, in a San Francisco game. This late interception cost us, not the defense, but Drew Brees. And I enjoy the show, uh, Eric, every Thursday, baby. Thank you, you so much, care. Carl. We appreciate you uh, chiming in. Guys, it's, yeah, it's a completely valid argument. Drew Brees came up small in those losses when he needed to be Superman, mm -hmm. um, and it, they would love to cut down on the attempts, cut down on the need for him to be Superman. The only thing I disagree with is that he said they need more Lance Moores, and Brandon Cooks is too small. Mm -hmm. They're the same size. <laughs> the same yeah. size uh, exactly. But um, and I think Brandon Cooks is going to be great for this team. And actually, was leading all receivers in the NFL and in, in the amount of passes caught per target last mm -hmm. year. That guy's going to be a, a stud. But look, Drew Brees, no doubt about it. My only disagreement with that is just like I said, Drew Brees had 20 turnovers last year, and they cost him a lot of games. 
but it was the four, I think the fourth highest turnover total since he's mm -hmm. been in New Orleans. Uh, 07, he had the exact same year, even worse. I think 22 picks maybe that year. 10 and 12, same things. So we've seen this pattern. That is his Achilles heel, is he will throw those costly turnovers when he tries to do it all himself. That is not a sign of aging. That is a sign of needing a better offensive line, run game, defense, game management, fewer attempts. All those things are right, but it's not because Drew Brees is aging. It's, it's because they need a more efficient offense overall. Let me jump into the wide receiver argument. Drew Brees has done what he's done in the 10 years here. How many Pro Bowl receivers has he had? Uh, well, just Graham. Graham is the only one. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. And that's Zero. It, it, tight end, really. R Zero. Yeah. Point being, I don't know that the, 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 the question marks at wide receiver are going to be as detrimental as maybe some others, as maybe some would say, because you only have two guarantees in Brandon Cooks uh, and Marcus Colston. And I will disagree in terms of that security blanket, if you will, and I'm going to keep pumping it up. Because I just when you when you hear Sean Payton talk about him, I think C.J. Spiller is going to be a game changer for this offense. I do too. And uh, uh, Brandon Cooks, I think, is going to have a great year. Look, it's obvious you don't want it all on Drew Brees. When that happens, you mm -hmm. get what happens last year. However, when you have the pieces in place, there is still greatness left in Drew Brees. Let's stay with the receivers for a moment. Let's stay with Brandon Cooks. How do you think they utilize him this year now that they know what his skill set is? Looked like at times they didn't know how to utilize him last year. That's fair. Um, I think they <clears throat> thought the big thing to him would be, and they let Darren Sproles go and they mm -hmm. brought in Brandon Cooks, and I think they wanted him to use, use him in that role. Tons of screen passes, uh, end arounds, stuff that was designed to get him the ball quickly and then see if he, exactly mm -hmm. what you said, short pass, high percentage pass, maybe turn into a 40-yard gain. And that did not really materialize for this team last year. And I think maybe now that you have Spiller in a better run game with Ingram, maybe Cooks can get freed more on that with, without defenses paying so much attention to it. But late last year or, or before his injury, he finally started to get open on those deep balls. He had a 50-yarder, a 40-yarder, and a 30-yarder within his like last three games, I think. And he's got that ability too, sort of like Steve Smith in mm -hmm. Carolina all those years, That's even it. though he's yeah. a short guy. So he's got both of those abilities. I still think we're going to see a ton of screen passes to him, some end arounds to him, because they want – they figure once the ball's in his hands, his speed can take over. But if they can start using him as that deep threat, too, um, he's going to be really hard to defend. That's the thing. He's a guy that can get vertical and horizontal. And I, and I don't know. They, they, they kind of caught on to that midseason. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. he got hurt. He's not Darren Sproles. Right. Different player. But he is a true wide receiver. His route tree is very diverse. He can run every route in a route tree, which not everybody on this offense can. Uh, effectively, So I actually think there's a lot of questions about a deep threat. I agree with you. He can get behind a defense. He can stretch a field, but he can do it equally going horizontal as well If uh, uh, you know, on your bubble screens, quick outs, and those sort of things. Guys, let's talk about the tight end position. Look, I, I like Ben Watson. Um, and, again, looking at Josh Hill, he's got a tremendous amount of potential. Uh, can they live with those two, mm -hmm. or do they need Jermaine Gresham? The Jermaine Gresham thing is, is, is interesting because I, I can't get anything from, from what's happening with them. I to me, it's a no-brainer, just for the sake of he's, mm -hmm. he's an in this, in this prime player, um, pass-catching guy, which you could certainly use. Sure. Um, I looked at the tight end position during minicamp and OTAs. Other than those two you mentioned, no one really jumped out at me. So if he's available and the price is right, I would grab him. Um, I'm not sure what the holdup is with Jermaine Gresham. He obviously was in Arizona, and, and he left without a contract, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's just a matter of cost, but I think he could step in and fill a void right away. Yeah, he might be waiting on yeah. will somebody offer a bigger contract in the Saints money. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with Kevin Williams. They talked to him for mm -hmm. about six weeks, mm -hmm. and then he eventually signed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why not take your time? Why rush into the deal, especially when teams are obviously showing interest? Mm -hmm. I don't think they need Jermaine Gresham, but I don't think they need a tight end. I just did this last week and looked at the numbers. Mm -hmm. Before Jimmy Graham came to this offense, mm -hmm. the greatest productive season they ever had from a tight end was uh, Jeremy Shockey mm -hmm. in the Super Bowl year. It was 50 catches. I think it was something mm -hmm. like 479 yards and three touchdowns. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Miller had a season like mm -hmm. that, 45 catches, 480 yards, um, when Billy Miller and Jeremy Shockey would split time. They, that, that can be it again, and then they go back to throw into the receivers and the running backs. So they don't need a tight end because they had Jimmy Graham. There's no Jimmy Graham role in this offense, and Ben Watson and Josh Hill are a serviceable 
one-two punch. You don't need to bring in Jermaine Gresham and say, ah, now we've got our Jimmy Graham. Yes. It would right, become right. a one-two-three right. punch with those sure. three guys. Um, and then mm -hmm. maybe use Nick Toon more, Shontavious Jones more, Brandon Coleman more. Marcus Colston could catch yeah. a lot of those passes mm -hmm. that Jimmy Graham yeah, stole no, yeah. from him in the red zone. So I think there's enough total targets on this offense that they don't have to get a tight end just because they lost Jimmy Graham. But there is, an, uh, there is a vacancy there from a depth. But that's, 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 yeah. that's really what I'm getting at is they'd like to have three sure. guys you can yeah. count on yeah. because mm -hmm. you just never know, and especially that position, especially the way they kind of flex. One's a blocker, one's yep. something they blind up at H-back. A guy that can truly catch the ball wouldn't hurt. Right. Um, you may see Pete as, as that, that third um, uh, tackle mm -hmm. yeah. coming in, yeah. uh, and where, where you may have saw a tight end at one time, yeah. you know, uh, maybe in that, in that blocking. Uh, guys, when you look at, um, at the offensive line right now, just your gut feeling, how, how good can this offensive line be? It, yeah, I, go ahead. <clears throat> very similar to what we said about Breeze, what we said about the whole team. Above average, not mm -hmm. the elite offensive line they were in the years. I still think Jari Evans has a bounce back season left in him, probably. Mm -hmm. he's, he's been so good for so long. Does Unger help him? Uh, I think Unger helps the interior yeah, in general, yeah, yeah because mean. that was a weakness. If, if Unger I, – I haven't studied Unger, you know, enough. Mm -hmm. but right. He wasn't on the Saints, uh, but his reputation was so good. There's beast mode Marshawn Lynch mm -hmm. running behind him, an athletic guy who used to be an offensive tackle, uh, and they obviously targeted him. So I think that interior line's going to improve. I think their tackles now are emerging as better than ever mm -hmm. before. I still think Streep might hold off exactly. Andrews Pete for that I starting job because Streep has played so well mm -hmm. for so long, but Pete is going to be ready soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Teron Armstead is probably the best – talent of the entire bunch although you know the other guys are more established than him so that is a that, there's enough talent in that offensive line to be a very good offensive line they're just they were elite for so long and I think that was one of the hidden secrets to why the Saints had one of the greatest offenses in NFL mm -hmm. history and now they're just pretty good I think Unger brings instant stability to the uh, a critical part of that offense which is right in the middle uh, I thought Jonathan Goodwin really hit a wall maybe game eight nine last year he was just not the same player um, I don't. I am. I know people are worried about Tim Lolito. I, I think he can step in and equal what Ben Grubbs gave you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't think Ben Grubbs was the player he was when he was in Baltimore when he was here. Uh, I think Jari Evans is not the player he once was, but I still think he can be a good guard. Uh, Streep has been consistent. I mean, he's not, is he an elite tackle? No, but he's very consistent. And Teron Armstead, look, you saw the emergence of the ground game last year. A lot of that is because his run blocking ability. He may be the best run blocker uh, on the team. So I think that unit is better than where they were a year ago. And when you add that to a what looks to be a much improved secondary then you can start to put the pieces together maybe this team is a little bit better than we thought they were right. let's try the phones one more time deborah is in new orleans deborah welcome to inside new orleans sports hey deborah Hi, welcome to the show how you doing how are you tonight i'm okay thank you for uh, my comment is thank you for taking my call and i enjoyed the show thank you. but my comment is the team that we have now it reminds me of the team that we had in 2006. And we didn't know who was who mm -hmm. until they started winning. What do you think? And we didn't even have Jimmy Graham then. Yes. And so that's all I have to say, and I'll listen. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Sean? I think there's an 06 feel. Yeah. There's not the 06 patience. Mm -hmm. um, I think you go in 06, there's a complete a lot of unknowns. I don't know if there's that many question marks. You still have... You know, some well, people were a little distracted back then as right, well. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I, the comparison's very real. And, and as I said, I, I think you almost got that sense from the organization is the 06 principles. So in that regard, and the fact that there's a lot of new faces and there's, uh, there's a little bit of unknown, I, I, I definitely like the comparison to the 06. But as I said, you know, when you got a $20 million quarterback and one of the highest paid coaches in the NFL, I don't, I don't know you get a year of patience. I, I still yeah. think you have the expectation mm -hmm. of success. Yeah, well, 06, the mentality is definitely there. And I, I bring up 06 a lot as the offense. You're trying to say who's going to replace. A lot of people want to know who's going to replace Jimmy Graham. Who are their receiving threats? Um, are they going to be a run first team? And um, Deuce and Reggie, Ingram and Spiller, mm -hmm. um, tight end's not a big focus. Back to the, the receivers being a big focus. Uh, I think we could see a return to that being what their offense looks like for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the offensive line was a big question mark that year. Uh, guys were taking over uh, like four weeks into the preseason, Stinchcomb and Jari Evans, yes. so maybe it emerges. Um, mentality is a big part of it too. That, that, that team became very driven when they realized they had a chance to win. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this team's a little more humbled and, and feel there's a little bit of a starting over from scratch feeling. So there's a lot of good comparisons there, I think. Quarterback position. 
uh, on paper, looks pretty strong. Uh, you know, uh, from, from the starting corners to the, this is going to be a battle for the third cornerback position. Fool's goal, or, or is this legit? I, I think there, it was such a hole at that opposite corner, mm -hmm. Keenan Lewis, last year. I, I don't know if it's fool's goal. I, I, think it's, I, I think they're better than what they were a year ago. Now, are they going to be the fourth-ranked defense in the NFL? I don't know. Um, but I do know this. The, when you look at, you know, Brandon Browner, they brought in Kyle Wilson late. They mm -hmm. drafted two corners. They were not going to leave themselves vulnerable at that position again. <laughs> right. So uh, I think they put an effort into that position. And, look, if they put that much effort and it's still that bad, then that's a problem. But I do think they're going to be better than what they were last year. Well, and I think there's even more overall talent mm -hmm. and safety, too. Uh, Jairus Bird is, is their mm -hmm. secret weapon this year. Yeah, like, right. everybody's given up on right. him because he had four bad games yeah, last yeah. year. He's a stud. He's probably the best player on the defense from, from a Buffalo. pure stump. Yeah, so he's got a chance to thrive again. I think Kenny Vaccaro is going to be on the right track again. Uh, they've got so much talent there. I think Keenan Lewis is great at the first corner. And I think Brandon Browner gives you an identity mm -hmm. at the second corner. Mm -hmm. uh, depth concerns me a little bit. They have depth. And I've used this joke. I think I used it on your show. It's mm -hmm. like we used to, that's how everybody used to describe the Iowa basketball team when I was there. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because your eighth player is just as good as yeah. your third player. Yeah, right, right. It's like, who is their third corner? Is it Delvin Bro? Looked great. Right. No TAs. Is it P.J. Williams, who they drafted in the third round? Is it Stanley Jean Baptiste, mm -hmm. who they drafted in the second round last year? Is it Kyle Wilson, who flamed out in New York? You've got a lot of options, but no proven options. So uh, it's it's it, there's certainly question marks throughout the secondary, but they have the depth and they have a lot of choice. So you, you'd like to think someone's going to emerge they, there. They've, they've got a lot of choices to, to work with. Before we go back to the full lines, I do think it is a good move that they are going to take on the New England Patriots at practice this year. I thought that was one of the deficiencies last year in terms of training camp, not being able to kind of gauge yourself against another team. I think it kind of gave them this false bravado going into the season where they all kind of drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, I do think this will be a good thing. Guys, your thoughts. I like it. Uh, can't hurt. They, they, they did it in 09 with Houston, mm -hmm. I believe, and 11 as well yes. uh, with New England. Am I right with that? Or they've was done it. Was that 10? Oh, they've done it they've almost, done it almost every, every year. year. Every year except yeah. twice, twice year. Twice with um, New England, three times. Look, at, at, that, at that stage of camp, it's always good. And look, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can remember preseason, and this is a little off topic, but I can remember preseason last year. We're talking, it's the first undefeated preseason in Saints history because it just, just goes to show you, yeah. you just never know. But I, I think in regards to where they're going to be located and, and how the, the, the schedule goes, I, I think it's a good, it can't be a bad thing. You're going against yeah. the world champions. Yeah, yeah every, I think everything that's an intangible from a mentality standpoint is a plus. It, if you're trying to say everything about training camp, uh, coaches' focus, mm -hmm. uh, players' attitude, how they're managing camp, practicing against the Patriots. I think everything from a mindset is going to be channeled in the positive direction this year, but that doesn't automatically translate. Back to the phone lines we go. Errol is in Harvey. Errol, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Errol, welcome. Thank Hello, thank you. Thank you, sir. Your question. Do you hear me? Yes, sir, we do. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, sir. Uh, yes, I want to ask you gentlemen. Thank you. Your question? I want to ask you, Jones, you think the New Orleans Saints did enough offseason for, for them to win the division? Th thank you for the uh, question. Guys, I think Hello? we answered that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, think I, I, I think they have a real chance to win the division because the division's so bad. Yeah. Well, I, I mean – I think it's first team to ten wins. I don't think you're. I don't think I'm picking. I'm not picking the Saints to win because I think they're going to go eight and eight, and everyone else is going to go seven and nine. Either the Saints or Falcons or Panthers can get to ten wins if it all comes together. Uh, it won't take twelve or thirteen to win the division. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I think they're capable of winning that division, which will get you into the playoffs. Yeah. Which in the tournament, who knows? Rookie that you think can make an impact, or rookies that can make an immediate impact on this team this year. Stephon Anthony steps out, uh, jumps out uh, from offseason, uh, given his position, uh, given that you know, I don't know that they have a world of confidence, David Hawthorne. I think he's a decent player. I don't know that they have, they have a world of confidence in him, but he really stood out uh, in OTAs uh, to be a playmaker, uh, and I don't think they'd be afraid to pull a trigger on him if, if he's showing signs of uh, improvement at the, in camp. I liked Haoli Kikaha uh, in, the, well. uh, in the offseason as well. Uh, there was just a play that stands out in my mind. Uh, where he, I mean, he, he, he made a move on, on Andres Pete, actually, <laughs> where he went left and kind of cut back in right, uh, which would have been a sack in the offseason. Uh, from a technical standpoint, he's very advanced in terms of pass rushing and how he's able to, the moves he has, and uh, may have a lot to do with the, the mixed mar or the, uh, the jujitsu, ju whatever he yeah. does in the mm -hmm. offseason. But those two guys really stood out, and maybe one of the corners jumps in as well uh, into the mix as far as a rookie. 
Yeah, and I would have mentioned the same two names as, as Sean, first of all. Uh, Stephon Anthony is the answer if he gets on the field. Mm -hmm. The problem is he plays a every down position. Right. So it's either him or David Hawthorne. Anthony's not going to rotate onto the field mm -hmm. for 30 snaps a game. He's either going to win mm -hmm. the quarterback of the mm -hmm. defense it, job, right. middle linebacker, calling the signals, yes. and then he's the right answer. Too, too much or, for a rookie, you think? No, uh, it's not too much for a rookie in general. And as right. a matter of fact, the history of this division, right. Curtis Lofton in Atlanta, right. Luke Keekley right. in mm -hmm. Carolina, um, <clears throat> Mason Foster in Tampa, and then this Paul Warlow in Atlanta. It's like Every, the middle linebackers always come in and start as a rookie. It, it hasn't happened for the Saints, but he's got every chance. Mm -hmm. It's a tight battle against David Hawthorne. He's got to win that battle, then we'll make the biggest impact. Uh, but Kikaha is going to get on the field and play 30 snaps, t 20 snaps a game as a pass rusher, which gives him the avenue. And, and it's going to be big, a big play mm -hmm. situation, yes. third down, so he'll get five sacks as a rookie or whatever it is. He'll you know bat down a pass or force a fumble. So he'll, he'll in limited action, can make an impact right away. It's Andrus Pete or Stephon Anthony will have to win starting jobs. Right. Guys, uh, backup quarterback position, nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, but this year, obviously, there's going to be a little bit of a battle. Uh, will Griffin stick around? Will it be McCown? We know probably Grayson is going to be on this team. Uh, Sean, what do you think happens there? Well, I, at some point, Griffin's got to take over for McCown. Okay? I think he was close at this point last year or in training camp last year until McCown kind of beat him out, and I think they trust McCown. Uh, but if it's, uh, it doesn't happen for, for Griffin this year where he beats out McCown, then I, it's probably in the road for him. And the best-case scenario was Grayson to beat everybody out because they don't have to keep two quarterbacks. <laughs> but yes. that's not going to happen. So uh, McCown versus uh, Griffin, uh, look, you see the growth of Griffin, and I think he has the capability to, in a pinch, lead this team. Uh, but I, I still think the trust factor lies in Luke McCown right now. Yeah, the problem with Griffin, I, I picked from this point on to the end of preseason last year that Griffin would win the backup job last year because the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You only need to keep two quarterbacks then. I thought he played very well, and I thought it was neck and neck, and they went with McCown. That kind of opened my eyes a little bit to how much they trust McCown. Now Griffin loses his quarterback of the future bonus. Right. He's got to be better than McCown mm -hmm. as the 2015 option, and that is a tall order when you consider how much they've trusted McCown. The other thing that I think McCown does that's underrated is you watch him in OTAs or practice, uh, he'll throw a pass to the backup receiver and then he'll chase him down the field and walk back with him. Grayson has talked about how much McCown has mentored him and tutored him. McCown has so many intangible things going for him that the fact that Griffin is younger and has a higher upside uh, has so far not been able to supersede that. And He's learned how to hold if he wants to get right. on the field. Well, <laughs> but also, at Drew Brees' age, do you really want to take a chance on having two inexperienced mm -hmm. quarterbacks behind him? You know, McCown's played in this league and he's won games. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if something happens or you roll on the dice said, well, McCown's going to be out there when, when the season, you know, if something happens in the middle of the season and we need him. So I think that's got to be the coach's yeah. mind as well. Yeah, that Griffin's going to have to be the answer to that question to yeah. win. They're going to have to say, yeah, exactly. if Breeze gets hurt in the middle of a game, who do we want going in the right. game this year, not their future potential? Mike Triplett of ESPN, Sean Pazan of Fox 8 Sports, thanks so much for being on our panel tonight on Inside New Orleans Sports. You. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of the show each and every Friday night right here on WLAE at 10 p.m. Also on Pelican Sports Television at 9 p.m. in the New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette markets. You can catch me on the radio, 9.90 a.m. WGSO, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. weekdays. You can listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com, and the TuneIn Radio app is a great way to take the show with you everywhere. And also, don't forget... All the previous episodes of Inside New Orleans Sports, you can catch those at ericasher.com as well. Again, special thanks to our guests, Mike Triplett and Sean Pazan, also to the WLE production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, uh, Kenny Juno, William Hill, and, of course, Nyla Jones. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Eric Asher. We'll see you right back here next week for Inside New Orleans Sports.